Indonesia's Corruption Eradication Commission, or KPK, have been really busy. Two state-owned enterprise president directors became suspects of corruption through fictitious projects. And this is on top of a massive investigation into money laundering within the tax and customs officials worth $23 billion, which may well be the largest amount of money laundering being investigated in Indonesia ever. And it does not help that since 2019, the amount of cases and suspects has been steadily growing year on year from 580 to 875 to almost 1,200 and to almost 1,400 in 2022. I mean, look at all these graphs. This is the number of corruption within the state and regional owned enterprises. And this is the trend of regions or mayors who are caught in corruption. And if these trajectories continue, Indonesia may be among the best country for corruption. We may well be opening up for applicants for those who aspire to be a corrupter, or we may well be looking for investors within the corruption industry because this growth is much better than many of the VC-backed startups out there. And in the words of a high-ranking official within the Corruption Eradication Commission, corruption in Indonesia is low risk, high return. So today, I'll be highlighting how money laundering work in general and the specific examples of recent corruption cases in Indonesia. Let's go. Basic question, why do people launder money? Put simply, money laundering is a process to turn dirty money generated from criminal activities such as corruption, drugs, and terrorists and make it look clean. I'll be using a he as an example. First, he can place this illegal money into the legal financial system. For example, he can purchase a property for $1.5 million and then he'll work with the developer to only report 500 k Keep in mind, the regulations are still relatively loose in Indonesia, so in the buy and sell agreement, the size of the house can be written as 150 square meters when the actual building is 400 square meters. So when the government sees 150 square meters, a 500k transaction can actually make sense. Therefore, by working with the developer, the reported transaction can be 500k while the other $1 million is actually paid in cash. And in the future, when this house is sold for $2 million, suddenly he will have $2 million of clean money up from 500 k Second, he can create fake transactions and orders. For example, he can open up a salon and create a fictional invoice of say 50,000 customers and each of them paying $200 over a year. He'll be paying payroll, declaring his revenue, paying the necessary taxes, and whatever margin that's left over will be seen as a profit from customers and doing business. Third, just enjoy the money. He can buy some luxury goods like Birkin, Rolex, Yachts, and supercars, and for some luxury items like RMs, spending on these items is the simplest way because you don't have to declare these items on the tax returns. I mean, in Indonesia, you technically have to, but hardly anyone will ever notice if you don't. Just don't go overboard. Case in point, Hush Papi, who is notorious for his cars, private jets, and expensive goods, and try to motivate all his Hush Papi fans worldwide, that as long as you have a valid dream and work hard, and most importantly, if you believe in God, you can achieve anything and everything. I mean, he definitely motivated the FBI to work hard and catch him for scams and money laundering. The first example of a corruption case in Indonesia that I'll be highlighting is the case of two SOEs or state-owned enterprise directors, namely the president director of Wijaya Karya and the president director of Amarta Karya. Both SOEs are construction companies. Specifically, Wijaya Karya is currently involved in more than 800 kilometers of highway projects as well as constructions within Indonesia's new capital in Kalimantan, and Amarta Karya is involved in projects such as airports, apartments, and sports buildings. The Corruption Eradication Commission has detained both president directors as suspects of fictitious contracts. You see, there's a critical difference between state-owned enterprises and private companies. Private companies are primarily focused on maximizing shareholder value and profit, while in contrast, state-owned enterprises focus on maximizing profit and fulfilling the government's objective in nation building to promote the public interest. For example, it can make sense for an SOE to build a bridge or a highway project with little profit or even at a loss as long as it is for the sake of building the nation. With this in mind, this becomes a loophole for corrupt leaders. The details and specifics of corruption within Wijaya Karya and Amarta Karya are still not released. But this is an illustration of how it likely worked. 
Suppose an SOE is involved in construction projects worth $100 million. The net margin is only 10%, so the cost is 90% or $90 million. The president director can orchestrate a fictitious contract worth $5 million and this contract can be disguised as anything, such as another subcontractor to build the highway. And being just $5 million among the $90 million actual cost, a corrupt individual strategy is to work together with the finance, procurement, and marketing division so that everyone can get a piece of the dirty money and share common interest to stay silent. And through this, an SOE can still earn a 5% margin. Compared to a privately owned construction company that makes a 10% margin, there's still a strong justification. Earning less margin for the noble sake of building the nation. If $5 million seem like a manageable size to you, imagine repeating this for years and years to come. The cumulative sum starts to become very sizable. The second example is the case of Raphael. Raphael is an interesting story because the one who kickstarted the investigation is his own son, Mario, after he ruthlessly beat up David and celebrated like Cristiano Ronaldo, disillusioned as if he's participating in the World Cup. The public outrage resulted in national scrutiny and the Corruption Eradication Commission has been happy to respond appropriately. Rafael, a high-ranking tax official within the Tax Directorate General, has been detained on charges of taking bribes from taxpayers and tampering with tax audit findings for the past 12 years. Rafael was a head of tax audit, investigation, and collection, so he knew exactly which company had problems with tax. And on the side, Rafael has six private companies, one of them being a tax and accounting consulting firm, Artha Mega Ekadana, or AME, to provide companies with solutions on how to solve their tax problems. It's an apparent conflict of interest, and here's an illustration of how he did it. Company X has a tax obligation of $5 million. X was finding ways to avoid paying this, and as the head of the tax directorate general who has access and power to clear a company's tax obligation, Rafael also acts as a consultant for Company X to strategize reducing the company's tax obligations. Company X, who is supposed to pay $5 million with the help of AME, now only needs to pay tax of 500 k X paid AME $1 million for his contributions, and this is a clear problem because Indonesia as a country will miss out on the supposed $5 million tax revenue. And on the flip side, there are also rumors of abuse of power voiced by the public. For example, let's say the actual tax is a million, but a corrupt tax official can extort a company by enforcing tax payments of $5 million through loopholes, forcing the company to work together with a corrupt official to reduce their tax. And this is not a problem. Another interesting method that was unraveled was how he hid his wealth. Out of his $3.7 million in assets, he only has two cars, a 2008 Toyota Camry and a 2018 Toyota Innova, amounting to less than $30,000. What about the Jeep Rubicon, his son, was seen flaunting on his social media? What about the Harley Davidson? He initially denied that it was his. It was simply borrowed. But upon further investigation, the car was listed under the name of a 38-year-old office boy who receives social assistance from the government. This simply does not make sense. How on earth did a social assistant recipient possess a car that's worth $120,000 brand new? So with Raphael's true wealth being exposed, the investigations broadened to his son and wife. His son, Mario, a 20-year-old college student, has a premium guest house and his wife was a collector of more than 70 luxury bags like LV, Chanel, Dior, and Birkin. She was well known for her lavish lifestyle on social media. Furthermore, the Indonesian Financial Transaction Reports and Analysis Center found $2.4 million cash stored in a safe deposit box under Raphael's account, which is believed to be from briberies. And to top it off, the same report also found a total transaction of $33 million from 2019 to 2023 from a total of 40 bank accounts by Raphael and his family. Today, those 40 accounts have been blocked. Finally, as government employees, individuals must report their wealth. And if we refer to Raphael's wealth declaration, he owns several companies and his shares are valued at around 100 k This is also another method to deceive. Declaring shares does not show how much your company holds or how much is your total company's assets. 
For example, suppose you create a company with a capital of $10,000. In that case, even if your company has a million or 10 million in cash, you still declare your original ownership of the shares, which is $10,000. That 1 million or $10 million will never be on your list of wealth to declare. And that is a perfectly legal way to underreport your actual wealth. Raffle's case has kickstarted a domino effect. The public now sees just how wealthy a tax official can be. And for law-abiding citizens paying their taxes on time, it is discouraging to see a corrupter's luxurious lifestyle, and it is incredibly disgusting to see an entitled son of a tax official who can ruthlessly beat up another young adult while his girlfriend watches. And on another hand, nation-building SOEs are also corrupt. And in the words of a high-ranking officer within the Corruption Eradication Commission, conducting corruptive practices in Indonesia is low risk and high return. The probability of a corrupt individual getting caught is low. Indonesia still lacks basic healthcare, infrastructure, and education. $23 billion is equivalent to 74% of the annual education budget in 2022, or 200% of the annual budget for healthcare. Indonesia should have been doing better. And I believe President Jokowi is a clean leader. But because corruption is deeply rooted, it is a problem that continues to persist. I'm trying to do my part by exposing our problems in hopes of greater international scrutiny of corruption practices in Indonesia. Anyway, if you want to see my analysis on Indonesia's unicorns, which company is burning the most money and which is the biggest loser post-IPO, you can click on this video. Or if you want to see more recent corruption cases in Indonesia, you can click on this video. Thank you, and I will see you guys again next time.